Hello, and welcome to Octane 21. Thank you for joining our session, How Chipotle Automated the Employee Lifecycle with Octa Workflows. My name is John Kern, and I'm a Senior Customer Success Manager with Octa, and I've worked with the Chipotle team for the last 18 months on their Octa journey, and I'm very excited to share with everyone today what Chipotle has been able to accomplish as part of their workflows rollout. Okta has many great brands and industry leaders across its customer base. And I must say that I am really fortunate to have one of my favorite places to eat as one of my customers. And by the way, if you have not tried the new quesadillas, you're missing out, but please wait until our time today is over before you go out and order one. I'm excited to be joined today with Nate Shear. He's a senior application engineer with Chipotle and is the architect, or what we also like to call internally, the flow grammar of what we will be talking about today. Nate, please take a couple minutes and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Chipotle and your workflows journey. Thanks, John, and thanks to everybody watching. So, like John said, my name is Nate Shear. I'm a senior application engineer for Chipotle Mexican Grill. Um, I've been in corporate IT for about a decade. I've always been very passionate about IAM and automation. I've worked in uh, different sizes of directory environments for companies of different sizes, layouts, and technologies, and I'm very proud to say that I helped set up Chipotle's Okta implementation and designed all of our workflows. For those not familiar with Chipotle, we are an international restaurant chain. We currently operate in the USA, Canada, UK, France, and Germany. Our focus is on food with integrity. That's food that's good for you, good for the farmers who raise it, and good for the planet. We currently have over 2,500 restaurants with 300 more slated to open this year. And we have 90,000 employees split between restaurants, two corporate headquarters, and a remote population. So before Okta, we did have some IAM architecture. It was fully homegrown. Uh, we had lifecycle management, but it was built off of databases containing exported workday data, our HR system. The key piece was the thousand line Visual Basic Script, which for those in the audience not familiar with Visual Basic Script, first off, you're lucky. And second off, it's basically the closest thing to hieroglyphics that will run on a modern Windows system. We were fully dependent on Active Directory for everything, and it just wasn't really suited for the future growth and flexibility. It was something that was definitely ahead of the curve in 2011, but well behind it in 2021. After Okta, our architecture is far simplified. So Workday still drives everything, but it, we're using the Workday as a source integration direct with Okta Universal Directory. So whenever a user is hired, a new account is created in UD, and likewise, the account is disabled when it's terminated. And then UD will flow that through to Active Directory and other systems through workflows, which is what we're talking about today. So we went live with lifecycle management in Okta on May 21st, 2020. Uh, that coincided with the GA launch of workflows, which was great. It really saved us with having to do a lot of out-of-band scripting. Uh, workflows has really been reliable to us, and we definitely plan on continuing to use it for future applications, especially the homegrown and exotic ones we'll be onboarding in the future. Thanks, Nate. Today, our discussion is going to be focused on four very specific scenarios around the employee lifecycle. We're going to discuss them in order of least complex to most complex in order to build on some of the technical concepts that we will be discussing. Scenario one is going to be deleting deactivated users. This scenario will be focused on when the employee decides to leave the company. Scenario two is sending emails from workflows. So this scenario addresses different ways to streamline the communication process with your employees. Scenario three, passwords and notifications for new hires. This is really focused on creating efficiencies in a very critical step of the onboarding process. In scenario four, provisioning exchange mailboxes via Azure functions. This will show the power of workflows to automate creation of mailboxes as part of the onboarding process. Go ahead, Nate, take it away. Thanks, John. All right, as this is going to be a fairly technical talk, I wanna do just a quick introduction to workflows for people in the audience who aren't familiar with the product. So workflows is a low code slash no code automation tool designed to help with complex identity scenarios. For the purposes of today's talk and frankly, workflows overall, there's really only three key concepts you need to know. Uh, all of these appear as cards in the interface, which you'll be seeing in slides later. But uh, the first concept you need to know is a trigger. Uh, every flow has a trigger. This is simply just the thing that starts the flow. Uh, there are many different types. Three examples would be a time-based trigger, say every day at 9 a.m., an app-based trigger, uh, which is using an app that's external to workflows, 
say like a user is added to universal directory, then you can have a workflow trigger when that action happens. Um, a child flow trigger, which is when a tr flow is triggered from another workflow. Uh, app actions, the second concept you need to know. Um, that is an action that interfaces with an application. Um, example of these applications could be Okta Universal Directory, Microsoft 365, Google G Suite, uh, many more. Um, and then functions are a general programming task, like finding a string in a list, an if-else comparison, that sort of thing. Now, as I said at the top of the presentation, uh, I have a long history of automation and scripting, and this makes workflows great to me because my programming background directly translates into using workflows. The logic of workflows is the same as any modern programming language you'd use. It's fully object oriented and it uses standard logical expressions like if, else, and try, catch. However, if you don't have a programming background, I still think workflows will be great for you. Uh, the UI makes what a workflow is doing easily graspable with those cards I talked about earlier. You don't have to worry about learning the syntax. Uh, you don't have to worry about things like indentations, closing braces, semicolons, that sort of thing that tend to trip up novice programmers and frankly experienced programmers from time to time. And uh, I genuinely think because the logic and terminology of workflows so closely matches a modern programming language, workflows would be a great stepping stone to learning Python, PowerShell, JavaScript, et cetera. You know, that's a great point you just made, Nate. For the members of our audience who think they may be lacking or not have the right technical skill set to use workflows, your point is they don't need to have that deep technical knowledge, that they can just jump in and be proficient in workflows right away. Exactly. Yeah. If you're an Okta administrator, you already have what you need to succeed with workflows. All you need is time to play with it. Oh, that's fantastic, Nate. Why don't we go ahead and jump into uh, scenario number one? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So like John said, workflow example one is the deletion of deactivated users from Universal Directory. So why do we make this flow? In Workday as a source configuration, terminated employees have their accounts deactivated in Okta Universal Directory, but not deleted. The restaurant industry naturally has high turnover, so we very quickly amassed a large volume of deactivated accounts in UD. Uh, after talking with internal stakeholders, we decided there wasn't really a need to keep these around. So workflows let us easily automate the deletion of these accounts seven days after they're deactivated. And this really just helps Okta keep clean, uh, makes it easier to search for users, that sort of thing. All right, let's get into the actual meat and potatoes. So here you will see a trigger like I talked about before. This is a simple one, just saying run every day at 9 a.m. UTC. Now, when the flow activates, it begins to execute these cards uh, from left to right. Um, you'll see here we're querying UD for all the users that are deprovisioned. That's the same thing as deactivated. It's just called, it's called deprovisioned some places and deactivated other places. So after this executes, it will return here an object containing all the deprovisioned users that are currently in Universal Directory. We're using a function to get the current date and time. We're subtracting seven days from it to get the current time seven days ago. And then we're looking at the users that were output here to find the ones whose status changed, i.e. they were disabled more than seven days ago. And then here we will have that list of users filtered down. From there, it will take this list of users and it will perform a pluck function, which basically just pulls out the user IDs because that's all we need. And then it will call a child flow that will actually do the deletion. Now I spoke about this earlier about child flow triggers. Basically, it's just a way for you to do some more complex logic by putting a flow inside of a flow. In this case, it's useful because we can run 10 of them at once. So basically, instead of having to wait for it to execute over every user in a row, we can do 10 users at once, which really speeds things up. And here's the child flow I was talking about. Very simple. Uh, we're getting the ID that was passed in from the parent flow and piping that ID into the built-in UD delete user action. And that's it. So Nate, what you've automated here is, is what was once a manual process. So how has this made working with this data much more effective internally at Chipotle? Oh, it's, it's made things a lot better. Um, just from a day-to-day -day admin perspective, not having a bunch of ex-employees makes it easier to find users by name in Okta. And uh, it also helps make sure that if a user were to be rehired in the future, they get a fresh account, which is better from a security perspective. And that seven-day window also provides us protection from 
somebody accidentally having their status change in Workday. So it's great. No, that makes perfect sense. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump to uh, scenario number two. So scenario number two is sending a responsive HTML email. Uh, for those not familiar with the concept of responsive HTML emails, it's basically a uh, an email that's styled using CSS so that it will respond to the size of the device it's on. So no matter if you're looking at it on an ultra widescreen monitor or a tiny phone, the email formats itself in a way that is looks nice, basically. Um, why do we make this flow? So we have several processes and workflows that send email notifications, reports, reminders, that sort of thing. I wanted these emails to be user friendly and nice looking on any device, but I did not want to have to write an HTML document for every single alert email. So uh, I would also like to call out Lee Monroe on GitHub here for providing the CSS that this entire process is based on. Um, I am nowhere near good enough a CSS and HTML programmer to have done this myself. So that's the beauty of open source. Okay, so here's an example of just a generic email. I kept it simple, classic lorem ipsum stuff just for the purposes of this demonstration. So here we see another child flow being called, and we're just feeding in header text, body text, footer text, and then optional alignment configurations. Um, the really nice thing about this sort of thing is you don't have to really know anything that this child flow does in order to send a nice HTML email. You just pipe the stuff in and it pipes a body back out, which you put into the Office 365 or G Suite, if that's what you use, email action, and it will send it. Here are examples of that previous email and what they'll look like on different clients. You've got the uh, desktop Outlook here, Outlook in the web, and then iOS mail. So you can see the various elements resize themselves and reflow themselves to automatically look good. Now, as I said, you don't actually have to know what happens in the child flow, but it's a very good demonstration of Okta workflows text processing capabilities. So we're going to go through it anyway. Here we see an example of how child flows can have multiple inputs. Previously, you only saw one, but you can really have any number of inputs with any type of data that flows from a parent to a child. And here we're getting the header, the body, the footer, and the alignment we talked about. Uh, there's an area here to do optional configuration of the color scheme. Uh, we've got it set to the classic Chipotle reds and browns you're seeing on this presentation. And then you can define fonts you would prefer to use if you don't want to have your typical web safe type fonts. So here we see an example of the document starting to be built by taking the items that were input at the start and processing them. Each one of these is doing a look for and replace with action. So it's basically replacing double quotes with this and quote entity, which makes them HTML safe. And then we see, here's one of my very favorite things in workflows, the compose action. Um, Basically, it's just a fancy text box that you can put things in formatted with you want with tabs and spaces and carriage returns and then drag in data from previous flow wherever you want. So you see we got the button alignment, the button font family and that kind of stuff coming from earlier in the flow. Then uh, here's a great example of some of the logical actions you can do um, because for the email to display properly, the body needs to be have it wrapped in at least one paragraph tag. Uh, it's checking to see if a paragraph tag already exists using this find action. And if it doesn't exist, which is basically it returning negative one to indicate there's no P tag in it, then it will take this top action here to wrap it in paragraph tags. And if they're already there, just passes the body through unmodified. And then here we see the whole kit and caboodle come together. The all the elements you saw previously are combined into this master compose HTML body action here, and then the body is output through this return function back to the parent. Just to wrap it all back up, here's where that comes out and is piped into here, and you've got an email. So Nate, this is really cool. A couple points on this. One, going back to our point earlier about not necessarily needing to have the technical skills, you've automated an entire email process here without any HTML or any other type of scripting that's needed. So this is a great example of someone who doesn't think they have the right technical skill set to be able to jump in and be able to be productive with workflows right away. For sure. And for those who are interested, uh, this is one of the templates that's going to be available on my GitHub at the end of this talk. Uh, I'll provide a link at the end of the slides. So 
truly when I said you don't have to know what the flow is doing, you don't because you can just use mine. Yeah, exactly. And then so on this email template that you've mentioned here, how many email templates internally have you automated as part of this process? We currently have about three active processes. Uh, we There's going to be more in the future, uh, but we have thousands and thousands of emails that have been successfully sent across the user base with this. That's great. That's fantastic, Nate. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump to scenario number three. Scenario number three, passwords and notifications for new hires. Why do we make this flow? So by default, when a user's provision to AD, Okta sets a random password and emails a static address. Uh, this wasn't quite flexible enough for our diverse population, but the nice thing is workflows lets us take actions based on different populations. Um, and also workflows lets us set a password that meets our specifications rather than just having a randomly generated password by default. So here we see a new trigger that we haven't seen yet. This is the user added to application trigger. So this will execute every time a user is added to the Workday provisioning app, which is the special app that uh, when you're using HR as a source, it comes through. Essentially, when a user is added to the Workday provisioning app, that means that they've been hired. So we want to start doing the new user provisioning at that point. So from the output of that, uh, we will take the ID and perform the UD read user action. We're checking for this custom provisioning info attribute we made, which essentially records when a user has been provisioned by Okta. This is a, basically a safety valve to make sure that if something strange happens, the provisioning process doesn't run twice. So here we're doing a continue if function. So the function will only continue if this provisioning info is empty, i.e. the user has not been provisioned yet. And if there's something in there, then the flow will halt right here and throw this message. Now, for a new user, they of course won't be provisioned, so we'll just pass right through here onto this child flow, which will perform more actions, receiving the ID that came from the trigger. Inside the child flow, we've got the ID, goes to another read user action, which pulls some various uh, HR relevant info. Uh, there's another flow to generate the password, which I'm not going to show you for what I hope are obvious reasons. Um, then we use the built-in UD action to set the password that is output from this flow for the user ID. From that point, uh, we want to expire the password so it can only be used once and the user is uh, has to change the password upon their first login. Um, there currently isn't an action built into workflows to do this, but this actually shows off a very nice feature of workflows. Uh, Workflows can make any call to the Okta API you want. So if Workflows doesn't currently have the functionality you need, the chances are the API probably does. So here we're just building the URL for the endpoint that will expire the user's password. And we're using the built-in call API function, which handles all of the authentication. You don't have to worry about keys or anything like that. And after this executes, the user's password is expired. Now, from this point, it branches off based on different populations like I talked about. I'm going to show you what happens for one of our corporate users or what we call Restaurant Support Center. So here we're checking for the groups the user is a member of. Uh, we're doing another pluck basically to take this object with all of the attributes on it and just pull out the names because that's all we care about for this. And we're checking to see if the user is in this provisioning RSC AD and email group, which means that this branch of the flow should run. We do another continue if basically, which is saying like if the user is in this group, i.e. the index of it is greater than negative one, it will continue. And if not, it stops right there. And here we see it using the email function that I showed you in the last flow. Um, it's doing more composes with the HR related information we pulled earlier, calling the flow and sending the email to our relevant corporate support department. Here's an example of the email. Uh, if For those of you familiar with the Okta uh, AD automatic email, it contains less information than this, but the nice thing is we were able to build this to the specifications of what our support people need. And then coming back to the parent flow, you see it set the provisioning info attribute we talked about earlier, which is basically just saying like, it was made by Okta on this date. And that's it. So Nate, this is a process that involves multiple internal teams. So considering what this process was pre-workflows, 
how has this impacted your internal teams to help them become more efficient in their processes? Um, I think it's been a help to them. Um, uh, before our corporate support teams would have to uh, go in and figure out if the user was even someone they needed to work on when they were just getting the default emails from Okta. So this is ensuring they only get the users that they have to take tasks on and it's providing them all the relevant info they need in order to provision their hardware and software as they need for their job role. So you would say it's definitely made a big impact internally amongst your teams? I think so. Uh, great. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move to scenario number four. All right. So scenario number four, provisioning exchange mailboxes via Azure Functions. Why do we make this flow? So Universal Directory has the ability to create mailboxes in Microsoft 365, but not if you're in a hybrid configuration. That is, if you have on-premise exchange servers. Uh, it's worthwhile to note this is Microsoft's requirement and not Okta's, as Microsoft requires those in a hybrid flow to have all the mailboxes created on the on-premise exchange servers. We are working to move to a cloud-only deployment, but the timeline didn't line up for our Okta deployment, and obviously users still need to have emails in the meantime. Uh, so with workflows mixed with Azure Functions, we were able to automatically trigger the creation of mailboxes rather than having it be a task for support staff. All right, here we see a, another trigger we haven't seen before. This is the user added to group trigger. Uh, very powerful, but important to note that this runs every time a user is added to any group. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that the relevant group is one that you'll want your workflow to act on. In this case, we have two groups for the different populations that get email. So we're making a list that contains the two groups. We're taking the group display name that comes in from the trigger and basically seeing if that display name is in this list. Then another continue if here. So if it's in the list, it continues. And if it's not in the list, it exits. And after it's passed that continue if, uh, we call another child flow to do the actual provisioning process. Now you may notice a box around this that says try. Um, this is a useful sidebar I'm going to go into. Uh, error handling is a very important thing in workflows, especially for your uh, critical functions like this. We absolutely don't want a scenario where a user comes in on their first day and they don't have a mailbox. So this lets us get proactive alerting if something goes wrong for the flow for any reason. Uh, the try catch functionality is basically saying like, it's going to try doing whatever you put in here, in this case, running this child flow. And if it succeeds, nothing else to do. But if there's an error, it will take this if error functionality, which in this case, it can be whatever you want, but we've chosen an email to our admin mailbox as the best way to process this. So we're just assembling the error information together and feeding it to a send email action. Now, sidebar over error handling over, let's get back to the actual process of the provisioning. So the child flow gets the ID in just like we've seen before. Uh, we're using a new action we haven't seen before, the uh, wait function. So because the, uh, the AD domain controllers that Okta connects to and Exchange connects to are in different sites. Uh, we implement a 16 minute delay here to make sure that the newly created user will replicate between them. Um, this is very powerful functionality in case you need to wait on an external system to do stuff. Uh, you can have it wait for really any period of time or wait until a defined set time if that's useful to you. And after that 16 minute wait has occurred, it will automatically continue through. So we're doing a read on the user again, taking the ID that was put in. This time we're pulling out the first name, the last name, and the employee number, which is an internal identifier we use. Uh, we're constructing an object where EID equals employee number, first name equals first name, last name equals last name. Then we take that object and we turn it into a JSON object uh, for those not familiar with JSON, it's JavaScript object notation. It's a common format for the interchange of data between systems. Um, so then after that, it takes this JSON object, encodes it in base64, which is a way of essentially compressing complex text down into a smaller format. 
wraps it in some XML tags, which is necessary for the Azure Functions integration we have, and then does an HTTP post to a URL. And so essentially what this is doing is taking this information and passing it off to Azure Functions, which has the ability to touch our internal exchange servers. And at that point, Azure Functions will take that information, uh, do a PowerShell connection to the exchange servers and do the mailbox provisioning. And then Okta, next time it syncs with AD, will take that new email address and load it back up into UD. And it's great. So Nate, this is a great example of the power of workflows in that this is not just a cloud only platform. In this example, you were also able to leverage workflows to integrate with your on-prem apps as well. Exactly. And it's important to note that this is not something that only works with Azure Functions. Uh, you could use AWS Lambda. Um, you could use really any tool that has an API that you have the possibility of hitting. Um, the core of what this is doing has nothing to do with Azure Functions. It's just packaging data up into a specific format using JSON, which is what you would do really for contacting any API. Okay. Well, we've covered a lot in these four scenarios, but there's some more key points that I want to touch on before we wrap up today. So the first point would be, Nate, how did Okta Customer First Organization help you with your workflows journey? Oh, they've helped a lot. Uh, specifically, you, John, uh, helped us get workflows pretty much day one. I think I actually sent you an email while I was watching the Octane 20 presentation right. about workflows because yeah. I just immediately knew it was going to be a huge help for us, and it has been. Uh, professional services was also great. Uh, they were instrumental in helping to set up the Workday as a source mode. Um, definitely, if you're considering it, I would highly recommend the professional services engagement. Yeah, Suresh was awesome as part of that rollout, without a doubt. Yeah, Suresh Bhatia, thank you. Um, Okta's workflow dev team, uh, they've, I've been in communication with them about workflows and they've been just wonderfully responsive and uh, taken a few of my suggestions. So just great all around, really. Oh, that's fantastic. So for the audience, kind of talk about some of the top lessons that you've learned as part of this journey. Sure. Um, I stressed it earlier, but I'm going to stress it again, error handling. Um, especially when you're building out a new process, uh, error handling will make your life easier. Uh, when you're building out a new process, it's going to error out. It sometimes takes a while to get the logic working 100%. Uh, there's sometimes things you don't expect, like that 16 minute delay I saw. Uh, definitely didn't know that was necessary at the start and the error handling helped us figure out what was going wrong. Um, as an admin, you definitely want to have your own signals tell you when something goes wrong rather than an employee or customer telling you when something goes wrong. So highly recommend that. Um, the other big lesson I've learned, I think, uh, if you have a process you want to replace, don't stress about having to replace the whole thing at once. Um, taking a small portion of it and automating it and then repeating that automation of small portions until eventually the whole thing is automated, I really think is the best way to go. And uh, the teams you're taking manual tasks away from will appreciate any automation, even if it's not just the instant removal of one of the tasks. No, oh, those are great points, Nate. So just the, the last point here and, and to kind of wrap things up, what's what's going to be next for Chipotle and workflows? Is it going to help me get my quesadillas and burritos a little bit quicker or are you going to be focused on things more internal? Um, well, I, would, I would love to figure out some way to actually know I wouldn't. <laughs> um, the, the, bur the, the burritos and the quesadillas uh, are thankfully a bit outside of my purview, but um, the what's next, I think, for us is admin accounts. Um, currently, the creation of admin accounts is a manual process, and so it would be nice when a new like IT admin is hired to essentially have workflows be able to see that they need those accounts and have them ready for them on day one so they can uh, get up and running quickly. Um, I think how we're going to do this is implementing either uh, a UD attribute or a Workday attribute that will essentially indicate that a user has the admin accounts and workflows can just scan for that attribute and uh, make the accounts automatically. So coming soon, hopefully. Uh, the other big thing is flat file provisioning. Um, we have uh, some processes for applications that are Okta integrated for SSO, but not for provisioning. 
because said app still requires some kind of flat file. Currently, that's fed from an ETL process on our side. I would like to start experimenting with having that being fed by workflows, because workflows actually has the capability to make files and use SFTP to send them to a destination. So I would really love to start to centralize all of that into the Opti platform. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Nate. We have covered a lot, and I'm sure the audience has some questions. So let's go ahead and open the floor and see what they have to ask. Yeah, and um, as I mentioned previously, uh, some templates from this chat will be available on my GitHub for those interested. Uh, they're essentially with workflows you can export and import as flow packs. And um, if you're interested in anything I've shown today, uh, check my GitHub out. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.